This is the third part in our series discussing Eurasian steppe nomads and blacksmithing, which covers as well society, economy, and even cities in the Eastern Eurasian steppes. In the previous two parts, I gave an overview of general trends and evidence for nomadic metal production, and then looked at some specific sites covering from the Hunnu to the early Turkic states. In this final part of our trilogy, our story starts in the 10th century with the Khitan ruled Lao dynasty, and then will take us to the Mongol Empire, where we see some of our most dramatic developments yet. The fall of the Uyghur Khaganate to the Kyrgyz in the 840s marked a new period in the Mongolian plateau. Since the establishment of the Hunnu roughly a thousand years prior, Mongolia had been the center of great empires. After the Kyrgyz invasion and retreat, it was politically fractured, fought over between smaller confederations until the 10th century, when it became a frontier zone under the sphere of influence of other states. First, the Khitan ruled Lao Dynasty, which directly ruled most of the plateau. Then the Jurchen ruled Great Qin Dynasty, which exerted tremendous influence and pressure in the steppe, making many of its peoples its vassals. And in the west, Khitan remnants established the Kar Kitai, which acted as overlord to the peoples in the Altai. Among them were various groups like the Naiman, Karyad, and others, vying for power amongst themselves or at war with their southern neighbors. It was this sort of environment that Chinggis Khan rose to power. What the Lao and Qin dynasty sought to do was control as much of the iron production in the steppe as possible, for both economic reasons and to protect themselves against the nomads. The Lao dynasty established a number of garrisons and towns across Mongolia, which served as hubs for trade and smithing and put access to these materials under Lao control. Some of these have been excavated, such as Ulan Harem, Chin Tolgai, and Harbuk, located in northern Mongolia's Bulgan Aymak. These garrisons contained Khitan troops, but also had Chinese farmers, attested archaeologically and in the written record, as seen quite observably at the Zum Harem Fort in Henti Aymak, a densely populated, walled, Lao era fort showing many buildings, Chinese artifacts, and agriculture. The most notable Lao era structure is an approximately 740 kilometer long wall running across northeastern Mongolia in parts of China and Russia, often, though inaccurately, called the Wall of Chinggis Khan. A ditch runs before it, and a number of forts and other structures are set at regular distance on its southern face. It guards a lowland between the Henti and Greater Hengan Mountains. While it acted as a deterrent against raids from northern peoples, it also served to control the flow of people in and out of the region, and tax them as they crossed the border, as well as any movement of iron. In the Lao and Qin period, there are many references to both dynasties trying to control access to iron in Mongolia. They forbade the trade of Chinese iron tools, weapons, and implements to the steppe. It was even forbidden to trade coins with the nomads, in the belief that these would be melted down into weapons. It was a means to protect these dynasties from nomadic incursions, coupled alongside efforts to keep nomads politically divided. We may presume the Khitan garrisons also disrupted supply lines or attacked alternative production sites in order to further break down this regional production. For the succeeding Jin dynasty, its lines of defensive walls, ditches, and forts ran along the southern edge of the steppe through Inner Mongolia for similar purpose. Defense, early warning, control of choke points and trade, and denying a flow of southern goods into Mongolia. Yet, iron working still developed. The Kitan Lao tried to restrict the flow of uncontrolled iron into the steppe, not stop iron making entirely. They could still make use of it, especially for their own garrisons and communities established in Mongolia, and for the groups considered most loyal. In the Qin dynasty period, it is well attested how the groups most closely aligned with the Qin, like the Tartar or Ungut, received greater access to metal goods, not just weapons, but jewelry and other desired wares. The Khitan period is actually very rich in findings of remains of iron tools and iron production, from finished products to slag of furnaces. Perhaps the Lao just resold a lot of iron material to the nomads, installing a monopoly to keep the nomads dependent on them. There is plenty of evidence for continued local campsite iron production and forging with small portable furnaces for everyday tools. Such production did not produce larger more specialized items that require more experienced fuel and larger furnaces, namely weapons and armor. Despite Khitan control, or perhaps because of it, we see a significant development in steppe metallurgy, an advancement in cast iron production 
and adoption of mineral coal in order to produce steel. Essentially, cast iron is made from iron ore heated to its melting point, becoming a liquid that is poured into a cast for its final shape. Though popular in movies and TV, it results in iron that is very rich in carbon and brittle, making poor, fragile weapons and armor. However, this is perfectly alright for implements, household wares, farm tools, wagon parts, and such everyday items. And at scale, it's more efficient than bloomery production. Due in part to this, in China, cast iron was adopted at mass scale early on. There is evidence for the presence of cast iron items in the Mongolian plateau dating back to the Hunnu and Turkic Khaganates. The amount, though, is small and may have been in ports as there is no unambiguous evidence for actual production sites as of yet. But the number of cast iron items in Mongolia rose dramatically in the Khitan Lao period. Perhaps the Lao government actively moved these items into the steppe to provide for its colonies and their Chinese farmers, craftsmen, and laborers, or it had undiscovered cast iron production sites in Mongolia proper. And this cast iron did not just go north as finished tools, but as scrap. As recent research has demonstrated, a transition occurred in the cast iron industry during the Lao period, in addition to its greater presence. They argue that we can observe chemically the adoption of mineral coal, addition of silicon as an alloy, and sulfide particles that allowed the population of the Mongolian plateau to turn cast iron scraps produced locally or imported from China into usable steel. Basically, turning the most useless form of iron they could acquire into the most useful. It's a bit of a new area of study, one done through chemical analysis of hundreds of artifacts rather than a textual record. We can tell that they started doing it, but we don't have records on why or how they went about it. Mineral or fossil coal has significant advantages over charcoal. Over millions of years, dead plant matter, especially peat, is compressed into carbon-rich sedimentary rock. To be appropriate for blacksmithing, it needs to be coked, a process very similar to making charcoal, burning it in an oxygen-poor environment, such as a large pile covered in dirt. Once this is done, it can burn substantially hotter and be controlled more finely than charcoal. And Mongolia is rich with mineral coal. Even today, coal production is one of the most important parts of Mongolia's economy, exporting millions of tons of it every year, and is relatively easily accessible through open pit mining, requiring only manpower and lots of shovels for medieval exploitation. Unlike Siberia or the Altai Mountains, tree coverage in the Mongolian steppe is quite sparse, which makes the wood-intensive charcoal production process a tremendous effort. Being able to utilize coal, then, is a huge advantage. The wonders of coal impressed contemporaries. In the late 13th century, both Marco Polo and the Ilkhanid historian Rashid al-Din described it with some awe, remarking on its usage in everyday burning in North China. Polo reported that without it, Northern China would have utterly depleted its wood resources. To use coal and these scraps for steel is a clever process. The cast iron scraps were placed in some sort of small enclosed space with coal and heated for a long period, reducing the carbon and thereby turning the carbon-rich iron into steel. Thus this brittle, militarily useless cast iron was transformed into a harder, stronger product suited for tougher tasks, such as penetrating armor. It did not require huge forges either. Evidence suggests this production was done in open-air nomadic encampments in their own small, mobile forges, as indicated by studies of these sites at Delgarhan Ul in eastern Mongolia. While the cast iron scraps may have come from China, the small scale suggests this specific process to convert them into steel was a wholly nomadic creation, indicating a wealth of experience and understanding of the process involved to recognize and identify temperatures, how long to heat the products, and so forth. The people of the past weren't stupid. They might not have understood why it worked, and they may have attributed it to different properties than we would today, but generations of trial and error are more than enough to understand cause and effect. And the Mongol Empire of Chinggis Khan really took advantage of it. The Mongol Empire marks the culmination of all the trends we discussed so far. This may also be archaeological bias, as the Mongol Empire is the best studied of all these nomadic states, with the greatest amount of surviving archaeological data, textual evidence, and researchers, allowing us to speak of it in much greater detail than its predecessors. For all the detail I will share here, we are only barely scratching the surface of the available data. 
With the Great Mongol State, we see large urban sites serving as prominent craft production facilities, organized by the imperial government and at a scale suggesting the purpose was for supplying the army and the people, rather than simply the elite, as we discuss in the Hunnu example. We also see an associated, sophisticated iron production network in the herding communities across Mongolia, which was operating in conjunction with these larger urban sites, incorporating the cast iron coal steel technique we just introduced. Chinggis Khan declared the Mongol Empire in 1206 and began to conquer northern China a few years later. With that, not only was Mongolia secure from raids, but the new Mongol state had unlimited access to supplies, laborers, and materials as the Mongols returned from China with thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, of their new Chinese subjects in tow. As well, the Mongols actively encouraged the coming of Central Asian Muslims and Turks who brought with them their knowledge. The Mongols' high value on craftsmen is well known. Famously, the craftsmen were spared after sacking the city and sent to wherever the Khan desired. In this way, People from across the world came to Mongolia, bringing with them skills and their tools. One notable case is an entire company of German miners the Mongols captured in Europe and sent back to Mongolia, along with a Parisian goldsmith who built the famous silver tree at Karakorum. All this knowledge buttressed that already existent in Mongolia. Though Chinggis Khan was no lover of cities, he established at least three in Mongolia, Avarga, Chinhai Balskun, and Karakorum. The first was Avarga, along the Harlan River near his place of birth, and likely the site known as Ik Ur in Yuan Dynasty sources, or Yiki Aruk in the secret history of the Mongols. Avarga is often called his first capital. While I'm not convinced it was quite this kind of role, it was a significant site. Archaeologically, it certainly dates to Chinggis' lifetime. What precisely it looked like at that time, though, is hard to say, as it went through about two centuries of habitation and rebuilding phases. It had a major palace on a large earthen platform, built on top of an earlier palace, perhaps contemporary to Chinggis, and features a temple complex, elite manors, roads, defensive walls, numerous residences, canals, and craft sites. 20 kilometers from it is a Mongol-era cemetery likely associated with the town. It also shows evidence for a massive ritual slaughter of animals. Evidently, it at least had a ceremonial significance to the Mongols. It also was not isolated, resting in a network of other palace sites of similar dating and layouts along the Harlan River, such as Hanzat. Again and again, we see this same system of the royal migration routes following a set path furnished with palaces and cities. Avarga was a significant production center. Not only was there extensive agriculture around the city, but it produced a range of glazed and earthenware ceramics while importing stoneware and porcelain. Importantly are also the remains of ironworking, all the slag and furnaces you should come to expect by now. But we also see these small iron bars only a few centimeters across and with a carbon content below 2%, making them adequate for weapon production. In the period of the Mongol Empire, they are found in large quantities, in consistent size and carbon content in all major cities, from Karakorum to nomadic campsites at Delgar Han Ul. They appear to have been mass produced in major locations, perhaps in larger facilities in the main cities. They could be transported easily and delivered to secondary centers, sold or handed out to the local population, who could then reforge it into whatever they needed, tools or equipment for the army. This indicates a system to supply Mongolia with access to iron resources in a way that, as of yet, has not been seen in previous centuries. Iron in these bars and in scrap form is found regularly in even nomadic encampments in the Mongol Empire period. At 13th century Mongol campsites at Delgar Han Ul, or in pit houses at the Sagan Arig site in the Tarvagatai Valley, we see the same collections of scraps of cast iron metal, and sometimes alongside these iron bars. These cast iron scraps were melted down in small furnaces with coal, meaning that even in these smaller, non-urban sites, we have Mongol smiths who are making steel. Obviously, this was not at huge scale, but enough to have an individual make a number of steel arrowheads for himself, small knives, perhaps even lamellar armor plates. It certainly did not replace bloomery iron production. At Sagan Ereg, we see indications of bloomery and the steel production at the same time in the same residence. The fact that mirrors production at Del Lirhan, Avarga, Karakorum, and other sites at the same time, hundreds of kilometers apart, strongly suggests this was a system spread across the entirety of the Mongolian plateau. Thus, the Mongol Empire had a sophisticated multi-layer metal industry 
and we know they were supplying the army with at least some products, or ensuring that the Minghan had material to produce components themselves. This brings us to a second city established by Chinggis Han, Qinghai Baloskun, named for his advisor Qinghai, one of the most powerful men in the empire. Its exact location is uncertain, but likely along the slopes of the Altai Mountains. It was observed by the Taoist master Cheng Chun during his journey in the early 1220s to see Chinggis Han, where a large population of Chinese laborers were seen. Though specifying the city was dedicated to agriculture, we can likely presume it was also a site for more iron production to meet the needs of the army, especially their elite troops, the imperial bodyguard, and the like. Considering there were 10,000 men just in the Keshig, the imperial guard of the Great Khan, it was no small feat to supply for them. Likely weapons, armor, fine arrowheads, horse protection was made from metal and leather as necessary for the guard. Chinhai Balskun was also not the only military colony of this sort. A number of other such military colonies, outposts, and production centers are noted in the sources across the Mongol Empire. With that, we can move to Karakoram. Likely chosen by Chinggis, construction did not begin until the reign of his son and successor, Ergadai, in 1235. The Orhun Valley was chosen due to imperial connotations with past Turkic empires like the nearby Ordu Balik. Karakoram was likely the largest pre modern city in Mongolia, in the midst of a dense settlement network across the Orhun. It was built to be grand, surrounded by over four kilometers of wall, with a great palace for the Khan and a massive Buddhist temple. Much of its population was Chinese, Central Asian Muslims, people from across Europe captured during the Western Campaign of Batu. The Khan himself spent only minimal time in the city. Juvani and Rashid al Din provide in detail Urgadai's yearly itinerary, a route of palaces and other camps that brought him into the city only twice a year. But during his rare visits to Karakoram, the population swelled as people came to sell their wares or take advantage of the Khan's generosity. Karakoram mostly served two functions. Firstly, it housed the Central Secretariat, the main governing body for the empire's civilian population. In Urgadai's period, this was headed by Qinghai, and organized with the other secretariats reconstruction and taxation across the empire. Secondly, it was also Mongolia's preeminent craft production center. From its position along the Orhun River and slopes of the valley, it was supplied with wood, chiefly larch, and clay in its hinterland. Even the granite quarries which likely supplied the city have been identified. A number of kilns and ovens are found within the city and just outside of it. Four kilometers from the city center, a row of 14 Chinese manteau type kilns were found. Roof tiles, figurines, pottery, ceramics were all made here. It also housed a mint for the coins of the Great Khan. Agriculture was carried out, though apparently with some difficulty and was a bit limited in what it could grow. At its height, the city required some 500 cartloads of food and drink imported from North China and other communities daily, though much of this was likely for servicing the Khan's court on its mobile journeys. Until quite late in the 14th century, the Mongol Khans continued to send large numbers of Chinese laborers and even garrisons here in order to support the local agriculture. It was also an important metal production site, likely for these earlier mentioned iron bars, but evidence for bronze and silver work is also known. There is suggestion that coal was the primary means not just for metallurgy here, but even heating homes as buildings were supplied with Kong heating systems. We have indications of bloomeries even in the outlying communities around Karakoram. There were evidently quite some facilities within the city. Hence the goldsmith, William Bouchier, was able to create the silver tree for the Khans. Silver, perhaps from China, Europe, wherever, was melted down in the city to build this icon of Menka's court, which had conduits in it to pour arag, Karakumis, ball, and rice and grape wines. These were far from the only cities and settlements in 13th century Mongolia. Recently, Harhul Han in Archangaya Aimeg has been excavated and studied. Smaller than Karakoram, it boasts a unique layout and 39 kilns. 730 kilometers east of Lake Baikal, we have the Kondui Palace, an extensive palace and community that likely belonged to descendants of Chinggis Han's brothers, Timuga or Hazar. There's Erchuhot in Hrvzgol Aimeg, a palace bearing an inscription of Menka Han, Kublai Han's summer palace at Shangdu in Inner Mongolia, two others like Shazanhot. Sarai Her, Khartoun, which date to the Chinggisid era in Mongolia. In Tuva, at least six garrison outposts from the Mongol period are known, the best studied being Den Terek. Like the Hunnu over a thousand years prior, the Mongols placed colonies in Tuva to exploit local resources. Around them, we find evidence for agriculture, crafts production, mining, and of course, 
ironworking. These goods too were shipped to the courts of the Khan. These patterns are apparent across the Mongol Empire. In the Golden Horde, there are numerous cities along the routes of the Khan, filled with evidence for urban and communal crafts in iron production, with complex systems to support and supply them. The Ilhanite, or Shield, then describes how the Ilhans, like Ghazan, organize iron, weapon, and armor production to make it more efficient and better supply the army. With all that, we can finally comment on the cultural importance of iron working to the Mongols. The best place to start is Chinggis Khan himself. His birth name, and that of his siblings and many of his descendants, comes from the word Timur for iron. His name, Timujin, with the personal suffix Jin, is something like Iron Man, blacksmith. Perhaps because of this, we get a really interesting phenomenon. Across 13th and 14th century Eurasia, from the Tangut through to Europe to the Caucasus, Byzantine Empire, Mamluk Egypt, and more, a whole host of people wrote along the lines that Chinggis Khan had actually been a blacksmith before he became a conqueror. This may be due to his name or borrowing even the Ashina Gokturk associations, where the Turks had been smiths under the Roran. Chinggis Khan, in other instances, presented himself as a quasi shamanic figure. He understood how to appear as a sort of intermediary with Tengri, who benefited from good fortune and sought to surround himself with similar men. When he had the shaman Teb Tengri killed, Chinggis showed himself mystically stronger than even a powerful shaman. Chinggis may therefore have employed some blacksmith imagery to cement this as well, as he symbolically forged a new Mongol nation, showing his command over the elements. We see hints of this in the dynasties ruled by his descendants. In the Ilhanite Rashid tells us how once a year the Han, his family, and his nobles took on the role of a blacksmith in a special ceremony, preparing the bellow, furnace, charcoal, heating the rod of iron, and beating it on the anvil. Written centuries later in the former lands of the Golden Horde, the Chinggisid prince Abul Ghazi Badr recorded a similar ceremony. When the Persian epic the Shah Nama was illustrated under Mongol auspices, we see Alexander the Great shown in Mongolian appearance. The great feats of construction and blacksmithing that he undertakes with the tail are thereby associated with the Mongols, such as the Iron Horseman or building the Wall of Gog in Magog. We could go further, of course, but this video is long enough as it is. And hopefully it has answered for you the question regarding nomadic metal production. They were perfectly capable of doing it and have done it continuously from the Scythians through to today. These larger iron production sites were supplied through extensive and complex networks, often dependent on eternal peace and political organization. Thus, these systems broke down alongside imperial unity as the supply routes to these centers came under threat. Yet. Even in such circumstances in Mongolia and the Golden Horde after the fall of the Khans, iron production did not disappear, but just operated at a smaller scale, adapting and changing the circumstances required over the last few centuries.